Next on BYUSN, conference expansion, flaming the fire. With Pac-12's media deal reportedly on the way, is Arizona on its way out to the Big 12? And what's the one question we want answered by the end of fall camp, which begins today? Oh yeah, actual football. Welcome to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. And by actual football, I mean kind of yeah. actual football. Yeah, we got a minute still. It's we, practice. We got a month. It's something. Tuesday, August 1st, I am Spencer Linton, and he is a man who is jacked up for kind of actual football, Jerem Jordan. I'm not that jacked up because my daughter woke me up and I actually stayed up and watched the USA Women's National Team play from I, 1 to 3 a.m. I apologize that you had I to am, watch that. I, that was a terrible game. You know, terrible. I said it's like awful. I uh, wish Ashley Hatch was out there scoring goals. <sighs> Still but bad. survived and advanced. Okay. Um, but Jackson Bowers is pumped. He is an incoming freshman, ESPN Top 300 guy. Oh, yeah. He took some photos that he released yesterday, and he is pumped. Yep. Uh, which I'm excited about Jackson. Someone uh, asked me this morning on Twitter, hey, we're gonna, is, is he going to get some playing time? Heck yeah, man. Heck yeah. Jackson Bowers is, is the future number one tight end at BYU. Jackson making a case to be involved in the Haka if and when it ever is performed at BYU. You remember when they used to do that, Bryce Machuica in uh, uh -huh. 2005, who I went to the same like elementary slash middle school for a second as Bryce in Vancouver, Washington? Yeah, that, that was fun, man. That was cool. That's the required crazy and the tongue waggle, if you will, that I believe he had the intensity featured in the Hawkeye. <laughs> yeah, the culture, the intensity, it was awesome. I man. love it. It was great. Dude. And I love today's show. Yeah, it's a fun show. Uh, yeah, we have the latest in expansion conversation ranging from Utah uh, not wanting to follow BYU, apparently. We'll tell you about that. To the Arizona Regents meeting today. To the uh, meeting that apparently happened two hours ago that we know nothing about quite yet. Uh, mm -hmm. With the TV deal or something from George Klyovkov and the Pac-12 uh, with the league presidents and chancellors. Blaine Fowler on that and the start of BYU football fall camp. Goalie Savannah Mason joins us live from soccer practice as the Cougars get set for a spectacular season. They are loaded, by the way. They only lost one starter. And watch list season continues. Which Cougar made an obscure one but was well-deserved? Ooh, I like that. All rise and shout. Let's get to what's trending. But if more teams beyond those two go, it's good night for the Pac-12. It's Pac good night, yeah. BYU, touchdown! Who's into the end zone for BYU? Cody Epps, touchdown BYU. Back the pack? Maybe not. We'll find out. What's Trending presented by Feastbox, donating 10% of every order to Full of Hope a charitable organization that feeds hungry families. Cougar feast! As Jerem just presented, Pac-12 President George Klyavkov is reportedly scheduled to present the Pac-12's current media deal to the school presidents today. That was supposed to be two hours ago, apparently. But not a word thus far. Yeah. Not a word on social media. The Arizona Board of Regents scheduled a last-minute meeting for this afternoon, we believe, based on them finding out whatever is in this deal to discuss the future of Arizona athletics. So, Jerem, as you look at all of the social media melee that has come out, and there has been a ton of it from notable and reputable sources, Brett McMurphy, Pete Thamel, Ian Fitzsimmons, among others, what do you expect the outcome to be from all of this Pac-12 debacle when the dust finally settles? I don't expect anyone to make a move today. But, I mean, we could see it in the next week or two, perhaps. It, it just depends. Like, again, if Arizona – and, by the way, this Regent meeting is for Arizona and Arizona State. So it's the two public schools, right? Is what, wh what do they want to do if the number is not good enough? If the ex it's not just the number, too. It's the exposure as well. If those two things are not good enough, then what? And Pete Thamel said that Arizona, Arizona State, and Utah – are going to uh, work together in their best interest. Will they want to blow this up? Oh, because man. if one of them leaves, it feels like that could be the end of the Pac-12. They yeah. could they could add two teams, <coughs> excuse me, but they're the they're clearly the fifth best Power Five at this point. So which of these teams? is going to be the one to leave and ultimately maybe be the demise of the Pac-12. Yeah, and to your point, and in Thamel's article, and I quote, he says. Sources say Arizona, Arizona State, and Utah, the Pac-12's remaining three of the so-called four-corner schools, Colorado's already gone to the Big 12, 
are expected to lump their futures together. Whatever that might be. If will it's they? the Big 12, would they lump together and all move to the Big 12? Would the Big 12 be looking to hit 16 if those three express interest to all collectively move together? Or is it 14? Is it just Arizona and we call it good for now? And well, it's Arizona, like figure out what you want to figure out <coughs> in the Pac-12. Will Arizona pull a Utah and pull away from its rival and go to a different league? Like, w w or will they work together in some way? I don't know how close they are or how close they are not, but it's really interesting. The most interesting thing, however, that came out yesterday was Ian Fitzsimmons saying the following on Twitter. Uh, it, this was reported by Tim Fitzgerald from Ian Fitzsimmons on, on SiriusXM College Sports Radio. I had one very high-ranking Big 12 official tell me when I brought up Utah as a two-time defending Pac-12 champs. They're okay in hoops, but they sell their football stadium in the top 35 media market. Quote, when it comes to TV dollars, why aren't they going after the Utes? I was told that Utah isn't exactly returning the phone calls. That shocked me, uh, ellipses. I was told that Utah doesn't want to appear to be following their rival in BYU. What? We all know that college athletics can pretty be pretty dang petty. But, I mean, look, we're talking about your future. Pick up the phone. If that's true, <laughs> that adds a layer to the rivalry of, nope, we don't want to be following them. Like, what level of ego is involved here for Utah? I believe that Utah would be the last team to walk out of the Pac-12, given their success recently. They have, they have nothing but uh, good feelings towards the Pac-12, given it's the Power 5 league they've been in, and they've won the league last they're two the years. They're the top dog for the last two years. On the field, they're the top dog. They are not the top dog off it, but they're one of the best right programs overall in the Pac-12. Uh, in football right now, they've won the last two. That's because USC has taken a step down. That's because Washington's not been the same. Uh, to Utah's credit, and I say that reluctantly, they have done a nice job of stepping through that open door. I hope one day BYU does that when Texas and Oklahoma leave and sure. perhaps there's a dearth and BYU walks through, through that door in the Big 12. But if that's indeed true, that is, that is shocking. Again, it's not about ego at this point. This is about survival, which has that's been the, the message from everybody in the media. Like, okay, we're beyond the whole, you know, in your ivory tower ego scenario. Wait, I thought San Diego State was an upgrade. Right? This is about survival. <laughs> if the deal that is presented today, and again, that reportedly being presented, we, we don't know for sure. We think because we trust reporters across the country. But if that deal is not good enough, then what? Like how, how close does it have to be to be good enough as well? Yeah, if it's 25 mil, but it's on... Apple TV TBS, Plus. TBS, TNT, and some combination of uh, CW and Apple TV. Then what? Is that good enough? Like, is TBS, TNT good enough to be like, no, 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 that's a big enough linear channel. John like, Wilner of the San Jose Mercury News said yesterday, if the deal that the Pac-12 presents is within 10% either way of what the Big 12 has. So Again, two, the Big 12. So two or three mil. 31.7 million. So if it's, you know, anywhere from 28 million to 34 million, he said... Why no one's leaving for a few would, million dollars per year? I wouldn't think so. And how long is the deal, by the way? I doubt it's that long. Maybe it's like, three or four years. It might be very short. Sure. I, I would imagine it's no more than five years. Okay. Like, like three that or four could factor seven. into teams wanting to leave as well. The Big 12 deal runs through 2031, beginning next year. So that's a seven year contract. If the Pac 12 gets back, hey, this is a three to four year deal, maybe five max, and it's three to four million less than the Big 12. Will it be though? Is that enough to push some of these teams? I, I, I hate to, to, to put a spotlight on what I feel is like pure conjecture right now because there are a couple of Twitter accounts that claim themselves Mostly to be inside sources, right? That yeah. are like, oh, it's gonna be about 20 million a year. And it's like, I don't- How do you know that? I'm not like, putting stock into that but, until like, I see something from a reputable source. Yeah, no, no, no. We just need to hear it. And, and here's the trouble with um, uh, George Klyovkov this morning. He's, he's got to show his cards in the middle of the game. It's not over. The TV deal's not done. Otherwise, they would have announced it. No, they're just like, we want to see the progress. He's like, got what's, to what's show his cards and be like, I'm acting like I have a full house, but I don't. Dude. This is the so, status. So yeah, I have two of a kind. I'm going for four of a kind. But, he, he's uh, waiting for the winner in the river to get flipped over in hopes that it salvages something. Dive in that river, right? bro. Yeah. Like he, he, he needs salvation in the river, uh, you know, Which speaking to uh, my card player fans. But 
Jason Shearer. They're big in this audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, hey, for Jolly Ranchers, another thing. Like 50 yeah, years ago, absolutely. we would have lost our jobs for that reference. Okay. Jason Shearer is a guy who is um, in the Arizona market primarily. Yeah. And he said, people are about to go crazy, so I'm just going to get this out of the way. He pointed out the Arizona Board of Regents meeting scheduled for tomorrow. It was this not from scheduled yesterday, previously. Today, yeah. There is no clear agenda for it as of now. Well, and I, I don't know what it is regarding yet. Well, that's the, that's the problem. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> Obviously, the agenda is what do we do after we see something yes. from George Klaus? I mean, con context clues would lead us that way. Context clues. Will someone decide to blow it up? Like, like if Arizona and Arizona State leave, that is, that is the demise. That is the end. Like, if, two, if one leaves, I think they're okay. If two leave, I think they're in real trouble. I think they're in real trouble. And, and the whole Oregon Washington What of Oregon and Washington after this? It's still funny to me because if the pack. The Big Ten really wanted them. Why wouldn't they invite them? You can always say you're coming in two years. That's what USC and UCLA got. That's what initially Oklahoma and Texas got. Like, why couldn't they do that? Because they don't want them yet. They don't want them. Otherwise, they do it. Your actions tell me what you actually feel. Or maybe they don't want them at the price that Oregon and Washington are asking for right now. What if Oregon and, and Washington and are not like saying, hey, we'll go at a discount? Yeah. We, what if they say, we'll, we'll go only 50 mil instead of 70? We will join at a discount. Then maybe does the Big Ten alter their position? Like, okay, you'll come in at a discount? And, yeah, and those guys in. will be just fine. Like, UW, UW and Oregon have a massive brand. Oregon is Nike. Oregon is Phil Knight. Like, they'll be fine no matter what. And UW will hitch their horse there, and they've got a great tradition of excellence as well. They're just fine. It's the Oregon States yes. and the Washington States and the, the Cal and the Stanfords that are in trouble. Honestly, if, if I am Oregon and Washington in, in this scenario and you're looking for stability and the deal comes back and it's, you know, t let's say it's 20 or 25 million, it's significantly lower than the Big 12 deal and it's not as, no, as many years and there's going to be no, it's like... It's not on Fox, yeah. ESPN, or CBS. And the Big 12 is like, hey, come on over for a few years. But they're like, well, we want to join the Big 10 eventually. Uh, if I'm the Big 12, I'm trying to broker a deal where it's like, okay, we'll join our conference. We'll be your Airbnb for three years while your home in the build Big 10 gets built. I would, my, my feeling there is that your mark would be like, nah. Well, with the big fat buyout where it's like, Hey, if, if the invite from the Big Ten comes... I think he wants commitment or nothing. Like, I it don't feels think that he wants semi-commitment. It feels yeah. that way, but who knows? I mean, if it's like, you need a home, we will provide that for you. If you get the invite to the Big Ten and you leave us, then you give us $50 million. <sighs> yeah, I think there's a certain amount of hubris of, nah, if you're going to come here, you come here. Like, and, uh, yeah, you're lo they'd be locked in till 31, like, unless they negotiate well, a That's why I said they can negotiate a buyout. But I don't... Yeah, everything can... And, yeah, exactly. But literally, <laughs> no, every, you sign up. It's a contract. No, that's you can get out of, you can get out of temple. You can ceilings. get out like of you can get pretty out much of everything. everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, topic two. And Brett McMurphy, by the way, just posted simply the eyeballs emoji, right? Last night. Yeah, last yeah. night. That pretty yeah. much said it all. Like, ooh, yeah. what do you know? Boney proposed a different one, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> what's the number one question you want answered in the OA football training camp? Okay, there are two that I have settled on. Um, this whole Big 12, Pac-12 <laughs> thing has, like, dominated my mind. So, in this show. So I'm, like, trying to push, like, trying really hard to push pause on that. Why? And just, <laughs> it's and so then, fun. And then dive into BYU football and just, like, put all my efforts into this. But there are two questions that I have settled on. Number one, we've heard so much about Jay Hill and aggression and let the big dogs eat. And it's going to be way more blitz Insert heavy sports. Fun. Yes. Yeah. Classic football cliche after it. Yes. We've heard so much about the aggressive nature of the defense and how it's going to be very, very different than what last year and years previous have looked like. Yeah. How much will we actually see of that? Will they actually show us anything to present to the media in these brief viewing windows that the defense does look a little bit different. We have 15 minutes today and Friday. All I heard, and, and this comes from the BYU offense, from Keaton Good Slovis and Cody Epps and guys in, yeah. in player run practices and in spring ball is the defense kicked our butts a lot, like on the regular, because it was new. Like we weren't used to this BYU well, defense. Well, to Keaton, it's all new. Yeah. So – there was some frustration, too, yeah. specifically for Keaton, where it's like, oh, my gosh, like this, they're kicking my butt. Jay Hill said, this is going to be good for you because we're getting you ready. We are preparing you for things that you could see in the fall. There's going to be some good deals. And yeah. so 
But that's just all we're going off of hearsay from the players and coaches. That's all it is until September 2nd. Will we see anything? Like, will there be like a notable change? Like, oh, wow, it really is more aggressive. The front is clearly, you know, getting after a little bit more than the classic drop eight and, you know, make the quarterbacks throw check downs, hold blocks. Yes, block eaters. Don't don't get after the quarterback, just hold your block. How much will we see of the new defense to signify that, yes, it actually does look new? And then number two, who in the world is going to be the BYU kicker? Yeah, I, I put out some information this morning. There's four dudes. Justin Smith, by the way, I was told medically retired. He's gone into retirement. So uh, it's four new dudes, um, none of which have kicked uh, a field goal ever in college. None have attempted a but field goal at in the collegiate level. Your boy Jake Oldroyd had not either going into 2016 and turned out to be uh, really good at the start of that year, especially in the Arizona game, and had a really nice career at BYU. So... Uh, it, Landon Rico's one of them. That's Ryan's brother, yeah. Will Farron from Boise State. Uh, Who was a kickoff guy primarily, but, yes. but not a field goal kicker. Correct. They had a good field goal kicker. They, they didn't need him, as I scroll to my <laughs> own tweet. I've, yeah, okay. So then there's uh, Matthias Dunn, freshman from Wasatch, Heber, Utah, and then Jordan Capisi, a freshman from Honolulu. Those are your four kickers. Yeah, Matthias Dunn, the coaches are really big on his big leg they, they, they feel like he has, like, the power leg. I want someone to be like, oh, this guy's amazing, but he has a skinny leg. It's I, a, it's a You know what I want? Leg. I want somebody to be automatic from 40 yards in. That's what I want. Spence, we need someone that can make a 53-yarder. I know. At Oklahoma State. I know. To win a game. But if you can L- go. Like, you make a field goal in the third quarter, and that gives you a 10-point lead. Like, for BYU to take the next step, they need that guy. I, I fear that if you don't have a good kicker, we'll see who it is. We don't know. That if you don't have a good one, that you lose a game or two. That you would have won that maybe gets you a bowl eligible. That's, that's the fear there. The unknown is uh, more scary than the known, of course. But, yeah, I, sure, BYU has brought in four guys they feel like are going to compete, and one of these guys is going to be the guy. With guys maybe that don't two. have any experience, I'll take, okay, he's automatic 40 yards in. He's about 50% between 40 and 50. Fine. Okay, I would, that's, for a guy who has not attempted a field goal in a game, if that turns out to be the scenario, sign me up. Yeah, I it'll, am on, uh, I am it'll, on it'll board change quickly that. because in game one, I would imagine he would kick a field goal in a game. <laughs> and then that's over. 40, 40 yards in, automatic. <sighs> yeah, in college, nothing's automatic, right? Yeah. A lot of college kickers can't make consistently a field goal between 30 and 39 yards. Like, the numbers are not good. They do not favor college kickers. I'd like to feel confident about a 45-yarder. And, and if I'm Justin, with you. If Justin I'm Smith you. was healthy and available, I'd be like, okay, up to 45. Let's do it. Always Let's pretty do good. it. Yeah. Okay. What about you? What are your burning questions? Oh, what's yeah. your number one question? Okay, re- real camp? quick. One is the what's the Pac-12 TV deal? <laughs> <laughs> That's my number one question. Get it out of the way. Yeah. And then number two is everyone healthy? Like, I, honestly, there's not a lot we can learn or have answered that is definitive um, in fall camp. A lot of that is revealed in the season. We're not going to be able to see the means. We will tell you what we're hearing and seeing and whatnot throughout fall camp, of course. We'll yeah. talk to Blaine Fowler in a sec, who's very connected, of course. But, yeah, is everyone healthy? That's the number one goal and, and like, thing I want to know at the sure. end of fall camp. Like, there are a bunch Lewis, of guys. Aiden Robbins have to be healthy. Like, Eddie Heckard, Malik Moore, Michael Harper, Ben By- These guys have to be healthy at a fall camp. Well, and guys coming off of injuries and surgeries, for that Max matter. Max Tooley, we talked to yes. yesterday. That uh, shoulder's got to be Bywater. healthy. Ben Bywater fully healthy? Is Max Tooley fully healthy? Yeah. Malik Moore, does he look fully healthy? I know he's had a full offseason to work through his injuries, but is he okay? Is Cody Epps truly healthy? He says he is. We haven't seen him. Like, is everyone healthy? It's a great question. All right. Our question of the day to all of you is this. Centering back on what has been percolating and burning through social media. It will for a while, dude. Do you want the Pac-12 straight up to survive? Do you want the Pac-12 to survive? At the Brig 12 on Twitter says, best case scenario is the Pac survives the loss of both Arizonas to the Big 12. Utah stays behind to soon be stranded <laughs> when Oregon Washington leaves and the Big 12 adds UConn as a 16th team instead. It's a nice balance of weakening the Pac, expanding markets, and hating Utah. <laughs> Well then, uh, it's, it's so Ma- petty and vindictive. Michael Lev, who's a uh, columnist for the Arizona Daily Star, says uh, Fish, the head coach of Arizona, had a Zoom with all players and parents regarding Pac-12 versus Big 12. Told them something will happen soon. Arizona is wanted and will end up with a good deal in a great spot. Mm. So there you go. 
Okay, after further review, rolls out the annual touchdown show tonight, 7 Eastern, on the BYU TV app as Dave, Blaine, and David break it down every touchdown from last season. Up next, Blaine Fowler joins us in the Cougar Council Room to give us his thoughts on the expansion news. Does he think the Big 12 is going to stay at 14 or go to 16? And what's the one question he absolutely wants answered during fall camp? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is sponsored by Beastbox Global Grill, a unique dining experience featuring Texas, Hawaiian, and Korean meats. Time to feast. Studio B with your day-to-day -day BYU Sports play-by-play. -play. I'm Spencer Linton alongside Jerem Jordan. Joining us now is a longtime friend of the program. He's a national champion and a dual threat analyst. Wait, what? to rival any Amazing. across the country. Uncle B, Blaine Fowler, is back from a trip to Barcelona, no less. You were just in Barcelona yeah. like a day ago. Yeah. Welcome and back. It, it's funny. Like, I don't know that we play on our Olympics as much as they – like, people would say, we, we, we hosted the Olympics here <laughs> in 92, and, and we go, oh, like, yeah, we had an Olympic Games too. We don't think to lead with that, but they still huh. they still hang their hat on that, which is really cool. What yeah. a beautiful city. Amazing city. If you haven't been to Barcelona – Man, I would just highly recommend it. So much culture. It's a beach city. We had a great time. It's our, Brendan and I always do a one week getaway right before this week, mm -hmm. before football starts and life changes for us. And we don't have a weekend until March. So we have to do something <laughs> so that she and I can connect for a week and then just hold on to that for, yes. for the months that bring football and basketball season. So that was our break. Hey, what a great time to do it. And uh, the Olympics that produced the dream team for United States basketball. And, and they stayed in the Hotel Arts right on the beach. And right behind that is the Olympic Village. And they were telling us, one of the guys, guides that we had on a bike tour was like, yeah, this is where the dream team stayed. And I goes, this is where all the athletes stayed? He goes, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just the dream team stayed here. Everybody else stayed in that Olympic Village right behind there. But Michael and the group, they stayed right here. That's funny. Well, so. my, Michael would uh, venture off to Monaco to, uh, yes, to yeah, gamble yes, and come back. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're talking, uh, obviously, fall camp. But let's talk about the elephant in the room is the Pac-12 and the Big yeah. 12 and everything. Did you have the internet in Barcelona? To oh, yeah. Were you following all that? How do you not follow it? <laughs> like, people over there weren't following it, but certainly we were – following it while we were there, mostly through Twitter. When you're over there, that's how you keep up on news. But, yeah, yeah it's interesting to me, and I know we're going to hear some things in the next couple of days. Um, and I heard you guys just now as I was listening to the end of that last segment talking about it's interesting from a fan perspective, nobody wants Utah. They want Utah, to, like, damaged by this, right? Um, I think it would be great to have Utah in the conference. And to think that Utah's not having conversations is naive. Like, they're, they're talking to Colorado about what they did before they did it. They're, they're weighing all of their options to see what's viable and what's left. And I think what Colorado probably did is said, hey, this musical chairs game, we're not the most attractive team in the Pac-12, and we've got a chair that's open for us right now, and the music hasn't even stopped. So let's take the sure thing and sit in the chair right now, because when the music stops and we get this deal and it's not as what we hoped it would be, there might not be any chairs for us. So let's take it. But I do feel like it was the first domino that fell. So others are going, oh, man, like now there's one less chair. So wh what do we do here? Um, so I think there'll be at least one more team from the pack that'll go before this is said and done and maybe three more we're, we're going to see. Who do you think the one would be? Arizona? I think Arizona is the most likely because they've been having conversations along with yeah. Colorado. And, and the Big 12 values good basketball. Let's face it. It's the top basketball league in America. And, and Arizona has facilities and some history in football where they could – could upgrade and get good, but they're they're a national basketball program that could compete right now in that league. So they make a lot of sense. The ingenuity and the gamesmanship of Big 12 Commissioner Brett Yormark to just float out August 1st as the date that he wants to, you know, make the decision by is just it's a subtle play, but it is really, really big time. Because now you're forcing the hand of the Pac-12 to be like, we, we got to see what the deal is. You know, they need George Klyovkov to present to them the numbers because there's, again, there's that last spot we think, hey, we got room for one more. Who, At who, least one. Who's, yeah. who's going to be it? Yeah. Um, so for him to do that and kind of put it on a timetable, it's just, it's just all this fascinates me. And, you know, while you said, like, Utah's – I'm sure doing the research. We, I mean, we, was, we heard there yesterday was there was a report that said that they're slow to answer the phone. But they, yeah, I saw that same same report. Do, do you believe they're talking to people, or do you know that? No, I think that they're talking okay. to people. Yeah, 
I believe they are. I, I have a little bit of news. It'd be really can. naive of them to not yeah. at least field the phone no, call. No, they're talking right? to people. They just, I think that their primary hope is that this deal is something good and they can stay where they are. They feel like it's a good fit. Um, and, and that's all fine. Um, but I don't think they've not been answering the phone. I think that they're pursuing and balancing all things. And I don't, you know, I don't think that they felt like they had to be in a share before the music stopped. Yeah. Right. But I do think that Colorado did. I think but now did. that they did that, it makes it a little more desperate. And your yeah. mark's not only been brilliant with this whole management of this and the, and the, and the, the way it all looks, but from the very beginning, it was like, Hey, let's go get an extension on the deal right now. Let's go. Let's not wait around for everybody else to see what's left over. He's been ahead of the curve since the day he stepped in to that role. And, you know, we had him not sh not very long after on our Countdown to Kickoff game day show, right? Um, and he sat down with us, and we visited with him off air. And when he walked away, we just all looked at each other and said, okay, this guy's a visionary. He gets it. He's not going to sit around and wait for things to happen and then try to pick up the pieces. He's going to be proactive and not reactive, and it's – it has shown up in a big way. The Big 12 is in the best spot it's been in in years. Okay, well, fall camp. What's the uh, burning question you want answered by the end of fall camp? Can Keaton Slovis be the Keaton Slovis that played the, his first two years at USC? Can he get that confidence back and that mojo back, understand this offense well enough to get the ball out on time and make good decisions and be a leader? The, what we've heard all summer long um, and through spring ball was, this dude gets it. He's a phenomenal leader. Everybody loves him on this team. He's come in and hasn't acted big time. He's like fit right in. Um, he's picked up the offense quickly. Here's what we know as, as a sure thing. He can make every throw in the playbook. Every throw in the playbook. Physically, he's gifted. He has an NFL skill set. But remember, we said that about Zach Wilson his sophomore year. And I kept saying, now if Zach can start to get the ball out on time and make better decisions... He can be big time, and he made such progression, and then be, and in his junior year, he was ridiculous, right? So Keaton was somewhat ridiculous his first couple of years in that offense. I think he fits really well. If he can grasp this and, and find the right receivers, get, make great pre-snaps reads and get the ball, I know he can make all the throws and physically can play that position. If he can do that and prove that by the end of fall camp, hey, let's face it, it's the most important position in any team sport Period. I don't care what sport it is. It is the most important team sport individual position. You, to be good, you have to be good there. So he has to be good, and that's what I'm watching. Amen. Blaine Fowler is with us on BYU Sports Nation. Okay, if it's not the quarterback position, which position group do you feel the most confident in heading into 2023 BYU training camp? Kind of 1A, 1B. I, probably 1A, the offensive line. And people aren't really talking that much about it, but you got five guys that are going to start that have started a ton of football games and a bunch of P5 football games. Three of those starters will have started a bunch of P5 football games over their career, right? That This offensive line is better than they were last year. How am I saying that? You have Blake Freeland. Are you saying drafted. and the Barrington brothers? Quality? What, are you, what exactly are you They're saying? better. They have more talent. They're bigger and more physical, and they're deeper. Mm. than last year. And that was how can I even – guys, how can I, I don't be know. saying that? I don't, I don't know. know. How can you the, say that? It was the number one rated pass blocking team in the country, PFF, mm -hmm. and 12th in the run block. Have, yeah. That, have, have you, you, you saw these guys. You went and watched. Eddie Inn is – he is a monster of a human being and has good technique and, and, and long arms. Kingsley's a year older and better. Um, Pay is a phenomenal talent and a year older and better. Lapawahu, you go watch him on film. He's a monster. Paul Miley. And, and Miley has started a ton of games. He's a leader. Technique is great. Big, strong, physical. I think this line is going to be more physical. And so then I say 1A, 1B would be they are so deep at running back right now. And last year we were really concerned. Can they get a third and one? Last year in 10 was third and one. I got a knot in my stomach, yeah. right? This year I'm like third and one? Nobody should stop this team in the Big 12 on third and one. They should be able to line up kind of like when they had Tyler and not because they have a Tyler because – that's a really, really special, special player, right? But um, they got enough good running backs behind that line that I feel like can just knock people off the ball. I feel like third and one should almost be a given this yeah. year, and that changes your offense. If you can stay on the field longer, um, it changes the game. And so 1A for me is I'm really confident in that offensive line, and 1B is 
Um, you know, Deion Smith, uh, Aiden Robbins, Deion Smith. Miles Davis is back and healthy. Hinkley Ropati is back. You get the brand new freshman um, coming right out of, uh, of Texas that, and LJ that people are confident about. But but as you look at that group that's up on the screen right now, has BYU been that deep at running back? You had Tyler Algier, you had a Jamal Williams, but you kind of had them not this kind of depth at the running hope, back. The hope is you can pull off a Harvey Ungi, uh, Unga, Fuiva Kapuna, Manasse, yes. Tonga kind of group. And, and Where it doesn't matter who gets the ball, but Harvey's the horse, obviously. Think about how good BYU was in their ability to run the ball when they had exactly what you just described. When they had Everything those three guys. Possible. It's like third and two? They'll, they're getting this. Like, they will move the chains here. Because you've got to load up the box to defend the run game when you have those kinds of players on the offensive line and, and at running back. And then you load up the box, and then Aaron can be crafty with his play calling, and sometimes you play action. Play action's great on third and two and third and three. When you have a run threat, when yes. you screen to Hinkley, when, when people yeah. when people say, which I felt was at times last year, oh, third and three, I think we can play our base D right here, and we can we can stop them for less than three yards if they run it against our base D. If you want, so now we can play pass defense, but but if this year on third and three, we better put an extra player in the box because we will not stop them for less for three running unless we load it up. And so now now what if they play action? Now that's a problem. I think they're in a better position to manage that. If you had been better on third and and, and short and fourth and short for that matter fourth, historically right. bad. BDCU and Notre Dame. Absolutely. You win 10 games. Yep. And it's as good of a team as we were hoping it's for. It's such it's that such was an, a struggle. It's such an important down keeping the chains moving and sustaining drives is is unbelievably important for both sides of the ball. Gives your defense even if you end up punting and you get one more first down every time you're on the field, your defense gets more rest. They have more time to play, and your defense plays better. And so that was a problem last year. Remember, injuries cost them problems. They just weren't as deep. You're replacing an NFL rookie that ran for 1,000 yards. It's, they're in so much better shape at running back this year than they were last year. Okay, now on the opposite side, and I think I know how you're going to answer this because it's kind of been the same answer since spring ball, but – What's the group that has you pausing the most, that you have the most questions about, that, that you really are a little unsure about? Yeah, you and, I have to, you and I have talked about it. We've talked about it on the air and off the air. Um, I'm concerned about the safeties, just like who's going to be the – like what's going to be the group? Like they have three that have played a lot, and I don't even know if they know right now on day two. Yesterday was just meetings. Today's the first day out on the field. So they're in, they're in shorts and T-shirts um, today and tomorrow. Then they're in shells the rest of the week, and they finally get pads on next week. Right now, I don't think this coaching staff knows who's our starting two guys and then who's that third guy that rotates in. They certainly not, aren't comfortable with four. Not Micah Harper, Malik Moore, Talon oh, Alfrey? Talon Alfrey played. It's, it's those three. But do you start – are you confident enough in Talon at free, or do you need to move him at strong where he's more comfortable? And does that mean – and is Malik back healthy enough and have the right mindset that he can be the guy every down at free and can he be physical enough in this defense? Or do you need to move Micah to free and play him at free and play Talon at strong? Or is Malik back enough and going to be physical enough that you can play him at free and pay Micah at strong and have Talon rotate at both? Um, Malik can't play strong, so he's limited to free. Okay. So these are all questions in my head where I'm going, of all the position groups on the field, I'm the most unsettled. Now, I like those three guys, right? I feel like it's not a position where they can have a bunch of um, injuries. I feel like Raider DeMooney's coming in as a freshman. He may be a freshman that plays. He's really skilled. Um, but that's a big learning curve sure, as a freshman, sure. right? Yeah. Especially if you're in the back end at free, right? Strong's a little easier to play. And so, yeah, that's the position group. I love the corners. I love the depth at corner. I love the depth at backer. I love the starting three backers. And I actually like the D-line more than most people would think because okay. I think some of the guys that are coming back are in a better position in the type of technique they're going to play this year. Like Caden Hawes and Nice Amahe, their skill set and size fits this defense really well. And so all of a sudden now they're really depth. You add Cravens and Bagna and these guys, and, and Batty's bigger and more of a beast this year. I, I feel like I feel really good about every other level of that defense. The back end, I need some questions answered. What are they going to start? Who are they going to be? How are they going to go? Um, that's my big question, not just on the defense, on the entire team. Great stuff with Blaine Fowler. Thanks for the time, Blaine. Got it. Glad to be here. Come it's, in with it's an time. opinion next time. It's time. <laughs> Come on. He's rested and ready. Yeah, let's go. Okay, if you missed any interviews, uh, shows, games, you want to watch after further review tonight, uh, last week's show, download the free BYU TV app or go to BYUSN.com. Coming up, Oregon head coach Dan Lanning was not so subtle at taking a shot.
at Colorado. So do his comments maybe rule out Oregon as a potential Big 12 joinee? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event. Boys got that swag yesterday. Follow BYU Sports Nation on social media, Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, Instagram, yep. YouTube, TikTok, and Twitter. Welcome back to Studio B. Alongside Jerem Jordan, I am Spencer Linton. Let's roll out today's headlines. So first day of football practice for the Cougars this afternoon. They're going full pads in practice five. Full reports, conversations, interviews coming up after practice tonight and throughout the program, throughout fall camp. Can't wait. Some more college football news as it regards to the preseason all Big 12 teams. First team offense, Kingsley Suamataia. Second team offense, Aiden Robbins and Isaac Rex. On the second team defense are Ben Bywater and Tyler Batty. Third team offense feature Cody Epps, Keanu Hill, and Connor Pay. Third team defense represented by Jacob Robinson. Honorable mentions on the defense side go to Eddie Heckard and Max Tooley and second team special teams, Hobbs Nyberg as a returner. Suamata Io is also named a preseason honorable mention All-American by College Football News. Speaking of Kingsley Suamata Io, he was named to the Outland Trophy watch list awarded to the best interior lineman in college football and Austin Riggs is named to the Patrick Manley Award watch list for the best long snapper in the country. He's been a three-year starter when healthy. BYU women's soccer currently holding their first official practice of the new season today. We'll speak with goalie Savannah Mason in just a few minutes. And give you a live look into that practice. The NSCAA has the Cougars preseason ranking at number 16. Okay. The blue and white scrimmage set for this Saturday, August 5th. Honestly, I think they should be higher. BYU men's basketball held its first summer practice yesterday. They're getting ready to take a trip to Croatia and Italy later in the month. And uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Three Cougar golfers, because you know, as we mentioned yesterday, BYU is a golf school. Yes, it is. Carson Lundell, Zach Jones, and Tyson Shelley all advanced to the Corn Ferry Utah Championship. Lundell finishing second at seven under. Jones and Shelley finished tied for sixth at five under in qualifying. Championship will be held from August 3rd to the 6th at Oak Ridge Country Club in Farmington, Utah. Have you played that one? I have played Oak Ridge. Of course, yeah. Nice Dave, course. Davis Kim. Let's go. Women's golf signs uh, Lily McCauley from Washington State with three years of eligibility. She averaged a 78.8 uh, her freshman year at Wazoo. And in case you missed it, conference expansion news continues to roll out over the last 24 hours. Pac-12 President George Klyavkov is reportedly scheduled to present the Pac-12's media deal to school presidents in the Pac-12 this morning. Nothing has leaked yet. The Arizona Board of Regents scheduled a last minute meeting for this afternoon. The Board of Regents oversee, by the way, both Arizona and Arizona State. Pete Thamel suggesting that Arizona, ASU, and Utah are expected to group together, to clump their decision together, whether that's stay in the Pac-12 or go to the Big 12. We shall see. Those are today's headlines. As a reminder, presented by BYU Food to Go, the MVP of your next event. Now, we opinionate in the Cougar Whip Around. Presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Dan Lanning, the head coach at Oregon, took a shot at Colorado in a press conference when asked about the Buffs' departure of the Big 12 by saying, I am trying to remember what they won to affect this conference. <laughs> Does this take Oregon out of the running to join the Big 12? No. And it, frankly, it's fair. Like, they did nothing, relatively nothing in football. But Colorado's good in other sports. Uh, but as it pertains to football, yeah, Dan Lanning has every right to say that. Um, he's probably mad that they've caused this confusion. Sure. But it doesn't take Oregon out of the running. Everything is possible right now. Literally anything is possible. Although, I, I, don't, I don't see Oregon in the Big 12 soon. It's, it's not going to be a quick decision. That is for sure. Nickelodeon, by the way, will have its first alternate telecast, speaking of potential TV partners, Jerem, of the Super Bowl this season, with the broadcast certainly aimed at children. Should the Pac-12 consider a TV deal with Nickelodeon? <laughs> If it's 20 mil per school per year, <laughs> come on. Uh, no, uh, I, I've not watched it, but it looks fun for kids. Uh, can you imagine? Slime Zone, Pac-12 After Dark. Slime Zone. Oh, boy. <laughs> you football and build its new meeting room. You like? I do like it. it. It needed an upgrade. It needed a refresh. It's brighter, um, and I, I just I love what they've done with it. Dave Broberg and his team did an incredible job, and they're designing that and the construction teams that came in and refreshed it have made it look beautiful. 
It is it is bathed in blue. I mean that that yeah. thing they can uh, customize it, but yeah, it, it looks really nice. Uh, that's where we shoot the film. Room, so I'm looking forward to being there. Every week. It was time. Yeah, and it's not going to be so dark anymore in there. Like it'll be. Well, I guess. So they have these thicker lights. You like, turn you out the lights and then set those up. You want. Yeah. But I do like the brighter atmosphere in there right now. I just. It makes me happy. Yeah, it's yeah. very Tobias Tuke in there. It's bright. Times, yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice. BYU men's basketball tweeted out that Fusini Traore bowled a 203. My guy. Foos? What? Pro bowler? Is he a better bowler or basketball player? He's a pretty good basketball player, but 203 is. 203 is nice. 203 is like 20 a game in, in hoops. I mean, that's awesome. He's got to roll it consistently for me to be like, okay, yeah, maybe you should. No, one seek, time is better than you I've ever done. You should seek a like, career on the PBA, and we can well, watch you play on Sunday morning at 2 a.m. That's not what we're saying. <laughs> Just record it, or in my case last night, wake up and watch it. Um, no, no, he's, he's, well, it's a good question. Yeah. Our friend two Cam, three is awesome. By the way, our friend Cam True at Bam Bam's Barbecue regularly bowls over 200. Yeah. Well, he's super legit. Foos, we're just discovering this, <laughs> this talent. That's awesome. <laughs> you need to get Foos and Bam Bam together. Heck, heck. A <laughs> uh, charity event of some sort. Still on the way, BYU keeper Savannah Mason of the BYU women's soccer team joins us live from Southfield. It's practice number one. Why does she feel like this team is so different compared to last year when they bring basically everybody back? This is BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. What a beauty! What a goal! She does it again! Okay, I'm amped for BYU women's soccer. They're going to be so Let's good. Let's do this. I am pumped. Roll out the Big 12 preseason poll. Pick them second. Sure. Motivate them, no, whatever. Yeah, true. They should be in one, but yeah. Welcome back to the show. We are live in Studio B, and we are super stoked to take you live to the first practice yeah, for BYU baby. women's soccer on August 1st. Fall camp underway. Yeah, as they count down to what we think is going to be a magical Big 12 opener and Big 12 campaign for the Cougars. Savannah Mason is the BYU goalkeeper. She is joining us from practice. Savannah, uh, first and foremost, welcome to the show. Thank you for taking time out of your very busy Hello. practice schedule to hang out with us. Oh, no problem. Hey, did we I'm get happy you? To be here. Did we get you out of any running? <laughs> no, but you got me out of a very competitive game at the end. So hopefully Brent held down the fort for us. <laughs> he's a standing goal for me. He's in, he's in goal. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, a... he moves pretty well. He moves pretty well for how old he is. Where, hey, okay. <laughs> Where are the other three goalies? <laughs> um, one had to sit out. The other one's in on the other side. Okay. So we were we were just rotating, but he he came in for the stressful time, and, and I think he did well. If Brent hurts himself, we're never going to hear it's the our end fault. of this. Yeah. We are in big <laughs> that, big trouble. Uh, last year, I know he even he didn't even have his gloves this time. Usually he's a little <laughs> bit more prepared. Oh. But okay, last year there were two goalies on the team. Now now you have four. Yeah. A little bit of depth. How how is that dynamic? Yeah. Cause last year was super unique that way. Yeah, it was super unique. Um, I'm really excited to have a solid group. I mean, I love Tegan and I had a great time last season, but it really does make a difference when you have like more of a group and there's kind of more competition. You can do a lot more in your drills and you push each other a lot more. So I'm really excited. Our group is awesome. Um, and so, yeah, we're ready to go. Savannah, I've had two different coaches on the staff tell me in fewer words, but we look really, really good and we just it feels like we've taken the next step from last year's team. So from your perspective, why do you feel like BYU not just looks good, but maybe have taken that next step? Um, I think an advantage that we have is we're a more experienced team. I mean, we only graduated one senior. So we've been able to play with each other from last season till now uh, without much change. And so I think that that, really makes up for a lot of things because we don't have to learn like not everyone has to learn new things or part of our system we're kind of just like getting straight into it fine tuning and things like that so i think that that's a huge advantage it's a group that certainly has high expectations you're in the big 12 now how are you guys feeling about how you could play in year one of that league uh we're so excited we're so excited for the challenge we're so excited to be the new guys 
um, I think that it's just like, a, it's just awesome feeling. We're ready to go. We're ready to show them what's up. Now, Jeremy and I, in our completely unbiased opinions, okay, <laughs> they're biased. We feel like BYU has a legitimate case to, even though you are the newcomers, to be picked to win the Big 12 in, at the Power 5 level. Now, if that does not happen, Savannah, let's say BYU comes in at number two or number three, how much will that impact your approach at the whole self-motivation topic? Um, good question. You know what? I think that, I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what external things are going on, where we're ranked, whatever. I mean, I hope um, that we can just come in and, and do our thing without any of those things really bothering us or affecting us. I think, of course, it always helps to, to have a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. You know, people overlook you or – or maybe not um, think that we're up to the task. That's always nice, but we're ready to go either way. So we're up for the challenge. Yeah, I think you're one of the programs at BYU that's handled success really well. Like if you're preseason number one, you guys will handle that well. You don't like need the chip, but certainly uh, it's, it's a motivating factor. What's it like having a goalkeeper coach in Tasha Bell who played at Utah Valley? She's been associated with BYU in sports psychology and mental strength, but now you have a coach and now you have teammates trying to distract you. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. They need some screen time. <laughs> uh, sorry, we were talking about Coach Tasha Bell. How's yes. that been? Yes. Uh, she is so awesome. We're so lucky to have her. It's been awesome to have um, just that, like, personal work, you know, where we can step off the side and do our own thing. It's nice to have someone who's so experienced, and uh, she brings a lot of great energy. And um, and so, yeah, we're we're super lucky. I'm really excited to get with, to work with her this season. All right, Savannah, uh, one quick hitter at the end. Uh, because your brother is now a member of the Packers, are you automatically a Green Bay fan? Yeah, I'm just a James MP fan. Yeah, so okay, whatever okay. team he plays for, I'm rooting for. Hey, yeah, so, so are we. <laughs> We're a James MP fan, too. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's really hard not to be. So <laughs> It's true. We're Mike MP fans, too, for that matter. The whole family. Yes. Haven, Let's you, go. everybody. Let's go. <laughs> okay, thanks, uh, Savannah. We appreciate the hey, time. thanks uh, for having me. You got it. Take care. We'll talk to you soon. Savannah Mason, keeper for BYU <laughs> Women's Soccer. Just jumping, jumping in the ding, background. Ding. <laughs> <laughs> this is what they do. You forget there are college kids uh -huh. until that moment. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, a rise and shout out to the dawn of a new season. This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Welcome back with our question of the day. Straight up, do you want the Pac-12 to survive? Yes. I do too. I do too. I want it to survive. But I want a couple teams. I want at least one. Want one more? Two. Maybe Arizona? Call sure. it a 14? Sure. Yeah. Matt Moon on Instagram says, I want the Pac-12 to take a bunch of Mountain West teams and have Utah be in the same conference as Wyoming and Colorado State again. <laughs> that would be awesome. Let's be honest. That would be sweet. So, so petty in the rivalry. I want New uh, Mexico in there, too. Kevin Lunt on Instagram says, I want the Pac-12 to die and Utah to be forced to go independent after, <laughs> after no. the Big 12 doesn't take them. Oh, how the turntables. <laughs> Like, it's just vitriol. <laughs> they get their own ESPN deal. We're like, well done. Oh, boy. <laughs> Our elite They're voice of the day. They're going to be fine. Presented by PAX, which just feels so fitting. Healthcare elevated. Sarah Bobo on Instagram says, I'm just happy BYU is in a comfortable position having joined a Power 5 That's conference. why we can laugh at this. We've been crying for years about not being a Power 5. As long as the Big 12 holds on to its power status, I'm not really concerned with what happens to the Pac-12 and its remaining teams. Big 12 is just fine, yeah. By the way, you retweeted this uh, during the break. Uh, Chris Brooks ended uh, Dolphins practice with a 95-yard touchdown run. Yep, Tua Tagovailoa ran the whole length of the field to chest bump him after the touchdown run. Now, was it um, was it one of those where, like, they're just barely touched and then they keep running? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But good for Chris Brooks. That's great. Yeah, any good, any news uh, like that is good news for a guy trying to make a run. Absolutely. Today's Rise and Shout Out presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. To the start of fall camp. Yes. Here we are. We're, yeah. uh, we're in football practice now. we got soccer practice going on, volleyball coming up, cross country coming up. Let's go, man. We're almost there. 
You are the new day, BYU football. I can hear the King Singers in my ears right now. Nice. Probably on BYU TV on demand somewhere. <laughs> Go to BYU TV. Our thanks to today's guests, Blaine Fowler and Savannah Mason of BYU Women's Soccer. Sorry to Dennis. We ran out of time. For Jerem, I am Spencer. Shout out to Erica Owens. Remember her? She was mm -hmm. an awesome keeper. She was a great goalkeeper. See yep. you tonight at 7 Eastern for a new version of After Further Review. Go Cougs. The touchdown show, baby.